practices like Monument Circle, our cultural districts, and most recently the Indianapolis Cultural Trail, a legacy of Gene and Marilyn Glick, are perfect examples of this notion that place and art can make a difference. Our Artful Impact Artie winner today, Eskenazi Health, is Indy's most recent example, how new public spaces imagined through the intersection of art and the natural and built environment can create such positive impact and new possibilities, especially the common ground, a civic plaza that is already drawing rave reviews. Making that beautiful space a reality is our keynote speaker today, David Rubin. Mr. Rubin is the founding principal of Land Collective, a landscape architecture and urban design studio emphasizing socially purposeful design strategies. Educated at Connecticut College and Harvard University, he has taught and lectured at a number of institutions, including Harvard's Graduate School of Design, University of Pennsylvania School of Design, and Southern California Institute of Architecture. David is the 2011-2012 recipient of the Rome Prize in Landscape Architecture from the American Academy in Rome. His key built works include the creation of a new campus in Commons for Eskenazi Health, the landscape at the California Memorial Stadium at the University of California in Berkeley, the three-star sustainable site certified Canal Park in Washington, D.C., and the establishment of Lindfest Plaza at the historic Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. So please help me welcome to the stage David Rubin. Thank you, everyone. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, I'm thrilled, and I know that uh, I wanted to thank the Arts Council of Indiana for thinking that I'm worthy of standing up in front of you. Um, I'd also like to say thank David Resnick and the board of the council, uh, Michelle Griffith in particular, for suggesting that I might be a part of this great day. Um, Dave Lawrence, of course, and his team, who have make, made me feel extremely welcome, and, and Brent Marty and Jeff, who really got me set up, and I really appreciate that. Um, could I ask uh, a real quick question before I start my 30 minutes, Yvonne? Thank you. Um, <laughs> which I have my timer up here, ready to go. How many of you are arts educators by hand? Can you raise your hands if you're arts educators? Okay, and uh, how many elected officials beyond our great Mayor Ballard? And how many of you are developers? And how many of you are philanthropists or decision makers for big, big institutions? Excellent, okay. It's all about you guys. All right, Yvonne, get started. Okay. For me, it's all about vulnerability, all right? Vulnerability is an incredible charge-filled emotion. If you put yourself out there to be vulnerable, you're gonna be creative, because you have to think real, real quickly, and you have to respond. Being vulnerable is an asset. All you guys in business, thinking about what it's like to, to be out there, vulnerability is what's gonna make you progress and be incredibly changing in the world. So the idea of making oneself vulnerable, which I am doing right now, is part of the process. Um, so, let's start. I start with an apple, because I believe in gravity. It's the thing that binds us to this earth. It's a universal truth, right? We're all on the same common plane. It's incredibly important that we recognize that we are all on this, on this connective tissue, because together, we end up potentially in conversation. And that's what I do as a landscape architect and an urban designer. The idea is to create places in which very different sorts of people might come together and as a result of the design that we create, um, enter into a conversation where they wouldn't normally, say a chemistry professor and a young protester, might find themselves in conversation as a result of the design. And as a result of that conversation, come up with an idea. And that idea, 10 years down the road, saves the world. That's what we do. I'm not smart enough to come up with the idea that will change the world, but I am smart enough to put people in the context of dialogue, because dialogue is what elevates culture. When we share ideas between each other, we foster creativity and potentially the next big idea that saves the world. Part one with thanks. So the start with art thing really got me because I went back through my files and I found this calendar from 1973. I was in fourth grade. Um, drawings were presented. This is my colleague of the time. I think it's uh, 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 
a, young, a young lady who I, I worked with, her rendition of floating out on a boat on, on the shore. Uh, another young colleague of mine, also eight years old, uh, thinking about uh, what it's like to describe home. And um, this is my drawing from the calendar. And I just want to point out a couple of things about it. It's absolutely self-deprecating. You're going to learn a lot about me in 30 minutes. Um, this is actually uh, a drawing that I did as an eight-year-old kid. And the thing that's really interesting when you look back on it is I was able to see that through glass and water, things are changed, refracted. And so the little pot on the right ends up being slightly disconnected. The pot on the left, you can't see the other edge because they're changed by the act of looking through water. And that's a spider plant on the left, and that's English ivy on the right, and holy cow, I'm looking at these things and they're actually becoming rendered in some way. Then no art happened for me. There was no art in the school after a, a period of time. And uh, so this is for all the art educators. My art educator was a guy named Richard Heyman. Um, he smoked incredibly. He drank a lot. Um, and, uh, but he did something. I ended up uh, going from a day school to a boarding school at the last year of my high school career, um, where, th so I went from an environment where it was um, very uh, challenging for me. I was failing out of school. I wasn't doing a lot of good things. I mean, I was a good citizen, but I wasn't doing great things in education. And uh, he found in me uh, an, uh, something that I didn't really realize, which was art, that I could actually think differently. I wasn't doing well in math. I wasn't doing well in English. And he found a latent talent. Um, and he passed away uh, several years ago. And I wrote to the school, and this is, I promise, the only thing I'm going to read to you today. Um, in contrast to my previous experiences at, sec at secondary school, Lakefield, the school that I was attending, emphasized the arts with equal stature to academics and to athletics. This meant that someone with my skill sets, or lack thereof, um, could excel and find confidence through the exploration of visual information. At the time, mathematics, science, English were disciplines in which I floundered. Through the visual arts, Richard was able to unlock potential in me that had previously lay, lain dormant, and it was due to Richard's belief in me that I was able to find a method of learning that has served me every day since. Richard offered myriad avenues of exploration, including ceramics, printmaking, painting, and one exercise in particular required us to draw a tree in charcoal. He literally sent us out into the field and he said, draw that tree. And what I learned from him was that actually if you draw the shadow, the light will describe the, the rest of the volume. So I, all of a sudden, an epiphany happened and I never saw the, sa the world the same way twice. By rendering shadow, you could create three-dimensional form. That was an epiphany. That guy did that for me and it changed my life. <laughs> he introduced art history to me. A method of looking at the world, observing information, and uh, changing the way in which one understands culture. So you could actually learn history through looking at visual things. Unbelievable. You can look at stuff and understand other cultures. An incredibly powerful tool, art history. He taught us ceramics. This is my ceramics class from high school, right? Doing, you know, all sorts of fun stuff in clay. You can't, it's great because you can't bust clay until it's really done, right? It's kind of wonderful. This is a self-portrait, and I'm talking a Chuck Close si uh, size self-portrait. This is an oil painting of me. I had hair at one time in my life. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it was a self-portrait. It's like four feet by two feet or something like that. It's huge for a kid that's in high school doing this type of thing, rendering an image. All of a sudden, I'm starting to learn. And uh, what he did, he ended up taking a small group of us to Italy. Uh, this is an image from Siena. He taught us printmaking, and he taught us how to render copper plates and press the ink and into the paper and stuff. And so again, this is, again, this is probably when I'm 16 years old. And uh, it was great because as with uh, that little vase of flowers, I began to look at things quite differently. It got me into school. Uh, I ended up at a uh, 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 Connecticut college, which was a liberal arts school. And that school was in particular very interesting for me because they asked you to, to study all these other disciplines outside of your major, but to look at those other disciplines through your major. So my, my major was art history, and my major was fine arts, and I had a minor in botany. I was a busy kid. And um, so this one government class, we were writing about uh, ideas of governance, and I wrote on platonic philosophy and the art of the choroid. So the male figure in art is a representation of governance, and I got an A. 
I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, I'm going from really flatlining to absolutely excelling. I graduated college uh, cum laude, and that was not what was intending. That's what art did for me as a young student. And so um, I ended up actually uh, winning the art prize. The school had a, a prize for art as well as other things. And uh, my mother uh, said, well, well, I don't think you can survive on art, David. Um, uh, so uh, as I was winning prizes, mom, come on. And so she said, you know, I really think that you ought to be a lawyer because lawyers have all the power in the world. And I was like, oh my God, I hate reading. I don't like to read. It's, I mean, I do now, but I, d I didn't like it then. And uh, so on the left side is the personification on the art of art. On the right side is the personification of law. I did end up taking the LSATs, getting into law school. Uh, I, w I got into Villanova, not a bad law school. Uh, but I also then took my portfolio from undergraduate and applied to the Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, and you didn't think that Harvard had a graduate school of design, but it does. Um, and I got in, and so I went to my mom and I said, Mom, you know, hey, I got into law school just like you wanted, but hey, I got into Harvard. Where should I go? And she said, I want the H on my car. That's what she said. <laughs> I got to go to Harvard. So, um, I ended up uh, graduating from the Harvard Graduate School of Design, ended up uh, becoming a landscape architect, working all over the world, great, creating great places, um, uh, one of them being Canal Park in Washington, D.C., and as a result of all these projects, ended up winning the Rome Prize, which in my discipline is the highest honor um, in, in uh, landscape architecture, so I'm really thrilled and it changed my life. Uh, this is also a, uh, uh, a philanthropically supported institution, um, uh, and the thing is, um, while I was there doing my project, I ended up exploring all sorts of art museums, and um, my name is David, and these are all the Davids that I began to find out in the world. <laughs> so David Resnick and David Lawrence, this is about you, okay? <laughs> so um, the uh, thing that I just wanted to point out was, um, one of the particular paintings that I came upon was this one uh, by Bronzino. It's a, it's a young man, um, a study of a young man. And I was with another scholar, I was with a Latin scholar, we were in Berlin at the time, and uh, I said, this is beautiful, this is a beautiful portrait. And uh, I, you notice that there's actually a statue of, of David and Goliath in the background, so it was keenly important to me, uh, representing beloved, somehow associated with this portrait, which is a bit of a mystery. He's pointing his finger at a book, and the Latin scholar could actually read the book because it's written in ancient Greek. And it's the story of the Iliad. And um, so for me, this, this painting is quite powerful because um, and we've actually put it onto our website. It's in the mission statement, the about portion of our thing. It's in the upper right-hand corner. It just, for me, represents the, the not just the aspect of beloved and the fact that, um, th that uh, you know, someone sort of trying to overcome something becomes something better, uh, but that it is in a process of learning, the travel through learning and art that you, that you, that you experience. And then, of course, Malcolm Gladwell make it, made it famous by uh, writing, uh, David and Goliath, and if you haven't read this book, I make this actually mandatory reading for all the kids that come into my studio to work, because there's actually this one part about dyslexia and success, and how people who can't look at written information can actually excel uh, in the world, and why they do. So um, that's just a little bit about me. I just wanted to give you, put it out front, let you know what you're, talk, what you're looking at. Um, Michael and Richard, thank you for coming. I'm gonna use the words art and design interchangeably. Please forgive me. I know you're purists about these things. I just want you to understand, um, for me, it's all wrapped up in one big thing. So part two, and I'm doing good on time, Yvonne. Um, a very brief course in landscape theory. So this is very fast, what I went to school for. You're gonna learn it all in about 10 minutes. Um, there is the economic landscape, right? It's all about the dollar, the economic landscape. There is also um, the political landscape, right? Um, landscape, as a term, is about, it's from Dutch, it's landskip, and it's about the horizon line, it's about the distant view, right? That's where landscape comes from. Uh, so, there's also, actually, truly political landscapes, and Mayor, I need you to pay attention here, don't fall asleep yet. Um, the, uh, this is the same place ten years apart, it's called Chiswick Park, it's just, it's in London, if you go to London on a, ba on a regular basis, please go see this. Um, Chiswick on the left is the Jacobian iteration. Chiswick on the right is uh, sort of post-enlightenment. And uh, what happens is uh, this. Um, England was dominated by uh, the French and the Dutch in terms of style for the longest time. It 
the environment of the great estates actually looked more like Versailles on the right, because Versailles um, was informing landscape uh, quite uh, uh, aggressively, but it was about monarchical power. It was about one guy standing on a balcony, looking out across the view, saying, I own all of this, and all of this is nature, and I'm better than nature. Boom. That's what that's all about. So again, it's the, the abbreviated version. So, um, so for instance, uh, what happened after the death of Queen Anne in England, um, the Whig party began to rise up. So the parliamentary powers began to inform the monarchical powers with greater strength. In other words, uh, we all began to have a, a voice. That was what was happening then. And what was happening with the English gentry was that they were going on their own Rome Prize tour. They were walking around uh, Italy exploring attitudes about art. And so what they were finding were things like Poussin and Lorraine and looking at these sort of tourist art pieces. So all of you museum owners out there, this at one time was tourist art, just want you to know. Um, and uh, two men actually happened to meet each other on the Grand Tour. On the right is Lord Burlington. On the left is a young set designer by the name of William Kent. And William Kent meets this, so he's the artist, and he meets the guy who has all the money. And uh, Burlington is a member of the Rising Whig Party, and he's trying to find a vocabulary for this new republicanism, lowercase r, republicanism, the idea that everybody has a voice. And he goes, and they become fast friends, um, William Kent begins to design Chiswick um, as if it was a Palladian villa, and on the right is Burlington's new home that replaced the Jacobian manor, and uh, the criticism was uh, 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 too, small, uh, was too small to live in, too large for a watch fob. So there was a great deal of criticism about what this, is, uh, what this was. What was most important was actually the change. So no longer these parterre gardens of flowers, it was lawn and stately trees and statuary. And at the end of the axis of this particular uh, homestead were these statues, and that is Cicero chastising Pompey and Caesar. So it was the aspects of republicanism, the voice of every human being, telling the empirical powers, get out. Right? It's all about us, all of us in this room. It's an incredibly powerful tool when you begin to use landscape as a defining element for what our condition is, what our human condition is. So you get temple structures, and you know, uh, uh, monuments like obelisks coming into the vocabulary of the English landscape. And you get amphitheaters, which um, in this case, uh, this landform amphitheater um, is actually at Claremont, is actually a recreation of the Belvedere Stairs in Rome. Um, uh, these types of forms are incredibly important because they actually represent the full spectrum of thought. It's actually why in our government buildings we have crescent-shaped seating from the left to the right, everybody is included in the dialogue. It's important to understand where this all came from. Places like Rousham in England uh, were also, again, political landscapes saying, we don't want any monarchical powers, we want the rise of the people. Um, in this case, uh, at um, uh, Rousham, you have uh, what's called the, the Gothic uh, uh, mill and the eye catcher. And what's important to understand is that's where the Gothic uh, mill is. It's a, it was a working mill, but it was faced with Gothic uh, features on it. And in the distance, it's what's called the eye catcher, which is essentially a triumphal arch. So it was, it was actually placed on somebody else's property, which I find is interesting. Um, but uh, it is essentially the idea that um, there is this heritage to the new republican ideals of England in ancient Rome. So it's saying the English are now the inheritors of the republican ideals of ancient Rome. Um, and in what's interesting is this is just a stage prop, really. It's, it was fabricated like that. And uh, it literally just stands up there like a picture frame on the top of a hill looking back towards the estate. Um, so it starts with those political landscapes, then it goes to the English landscape movement, then to the picturesque, uh, then to the industrial revolution, and then to the cottage garden. And that's why I like English landscape history, because it swings like a pendulum back and forth. What's important is where that blue line is, because that's where the founding of the United States happened. And so you can understand now why we have capital buildings that look like Roman temples, and why we inherited ro uh, grass. The only problem with grass is that it doesn't grow well here. But for all intents and purposes, we get our vocabulary in our landscape from, because we're the next budding off of parliamentary system. We are the, the triumvirate idea of, you know, uh, uh, in powers, and we're that much more elevated in the process of, of egalitarian governance. Um, so, 
part three. Let's check the time. We're doing good, Yvonne. Um, the value of art and design. This, this is important. Again, sorry, Michael and Richard, this is where I conflate all of this stuff. Um, the value of art and design. If you haven't understood it now, it's incredibly valuable to me. I hope it's very valuable to you. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think so. Um, I want to just go back to a, an older painting. This is one that sits in Siena. Um, it's called Good Governance. It's a, actually a six fresco painting series about good government and bad government. And it's the idea that through, let's get it right, David, through faith, temperance, hope, charity, magnanimity, and prudence, we can all have a good government. It creates the common good. These things support wisdom and justice. And for the people, uh, the phrase says at the bottom, it is all about the common good, which is incredibly important when you think about the value of landscape, the value of art in people's lives. So, elected officials, please pay attention. This is actually a description of my hometown, Philadelphia. It's an only map, which, which means that it's describing the architectural form in black, and everything that's white is the public realm. If you then, say, reverse it, then everything in black is now the public realm. It's the stuff that we all are a part of. And what's important to realize when you look at that map and you outline a specific portion of it, keep in mind that I didn't keep the waterfronts, I just chose the center of the city, you get an interesting acreage percentage. So of the 4,200 acres, the building acreage is 1,700, so the public realm is 2,500 acres. Significantly larger than you might expect. Why is this important? With my apologies to all the building architects in the, in the room, building architecture is essentially about particular types of people. You have to usually have a particular goal for entering into a, and participating in a building, save for a library, but e even then you have to want knowledge, right? Um, the uh, other area, the area outside of buildings, is then left for everyone, right? So the idea is that space, whether you're privileged or underserved, you have an opportunity to participate in it, and it's our goal to ensure that people participate well. It's also the lowest hanging fruit. The least amount of money can be paid to inform the greatest number of constituents. Politicians, that's why it's important to support the public realm. You're doing it, which is great. I'm speaking to the converted here, but I want you to know there is an effect in terms of the populace when you inform everybody equally in the character of the public realm. So, for instance, where does this come up? Uh, by example, Bryant Park in New York City, once actually uh, a, a needle-ridden place, you wouldn't think about it now because they do, you know, uh, fashion weeks and things like that there, but it was initially uh, a place where no one would go, even in a city of millions, no one would go there. And through social science and design, it became something extraordinary, once anathema, now a midtown marketing tool, Every property, this is for the developers, every property adjacent to this designed public space increased in value exponentially. And people wanted to be there. And so you end up with experiences of great numbers of people uh, participating in the public realm in that regard. So, for instance, in um, Philadelphia, uh, this is actually the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Um, it is or was at the time the least attended institution in the city of Philadelphia and has perhaps one of the most important collections of American art. It is where Benjamin West painted. It is our first uh, nation's uh, first arts academy and museum. Uh, it's where p people like Aikens also taught. And um, so they called me one day and said, uh, asked for a pro bono project, which I was happy to do. Um, they said, we have $25,000. Uh, uh, what can you do to help us be the uh, help us uh, be recognized by the public. Here on North Broad, nobody comes to see us. And I said, well, I can't do anything for $25,000, I'm sorry. Um, but I said, if you got $75,000, I could invent three projects that you could pick any, num any one and you might change uh, your experience. So I was using German road, the new German road mastic paint to actually brand the center uh, intersection uh, for them. I was creating a banner program for the artists so that the artists every season would create, you know, they would win a prize, their banner would be put together. It's a very cheap, inexpensive way of marking their territory. And I began to say you could etch a art action verbs and the names of famous uh, uh, graduates in the sidewalk because when people walk in cities, they tend not to walk looking up. 
they tend to walk looking down. They, you know, people just sort of walk like this. So if you can catch their attention in this way, they'll understand that something extraordinary is happening there. This never happened because actually, in the end, uh, the city decided to, um, well for you guys on this left side, um, they, they decided to expand the, their convention center, the Pennsylvania Convention Center, so that their main entrance is on the left, facing then the street opposite. And what we were able to do uh, then by talking to the mayor, Mayor, mayor uh, Nutter, was convince him to close the road opposite uh, because they were closing the road on this side. And by that, we would unify the campus for the first time in its history and create a new public space. And so he said, that's great, David, uh, except um, aside from making a campus, I'd like you to help make Philadelphia an arts-identified capital. And we need it to be the threshold to the museum mile because down this road, if you turn to the right, it becomes the Barnes Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Rodin Museum, et cetera. So this was to be a threshold and a marker for people from all over the world to say, hey, we have a place in art as well. This was the first sketch that I came up with. It was the idea that American artists would find them, would inform the plaza. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein's paintbrush stroke would become a paving pattern that glows at night. Um, Jackson Pollock's brush would slam into the ground, but it would be writ large the way that Oldenburg would do. Um, and it would be, you know, there would be furnishings in and a cafe and all this other stuff. Well, uh, in the end, they actually did hire Oldenburg and Oldenburg turned to me and said, uh, well, David, uh, we don't use hardware brushes to describe fine art. We use fine art paintbrushes to describe fine art. And so he said, we're going to turn it upside down and make it a torch, and it became Paint Torch, which is now the marker to the Museum Mile in Philadelphia. Um, and so this was the second sketch, second conceptual sketch of that space. Um, it is an extraordinary, it sits over top of a subway, it has challenges with venting, which we uh, made into social spaces. But, you know, it's about creative thinking. And the paintbrush stroke became this long curvilinear bench. There was a secondary piece of, um, of art uh, to be positioned on the uh, west side, as you're looking at it. The cafe, which is about to open, et cetera. Um, and th it's an incredibly constrained site. Tertiary spaces in cities are incredibly valuable to the fabric. Keep that in mind. Um, so a narrow space of 40 feet by 220 feet long with a lot of program in it. And this is what it looks like today. I was smart enough not to challenge Frank Furness on the beauty of his architecture, um, but in fact take some of the color and pepper the ground with it. Um, Jordan Griska, whose Grauman Greenhouse is this piece of art on the right, actually outdoes Oldenburg, I think. Don't tell the Pennsylvania Academy that I said that. Um, this is the view at night looking back towards the Pennsylvania Academy and the, and the paint torch as it, as it uh, was described. But most importantly for me, it's actually about this the social purpose of the space, that a kid would want to make a tent out of a public bench is extraordinary, right? This is what you can't anticipate, but you always strive for. The idea that you s they would use this very handsome bench, it actually receives the tush very well, I want you to know, which is all about public furnishing, has to receive the tush. Um, so, uh, the, uh, or this guy on the lower left, uh, so he's sitting atop the, what we call the city bed, which is actually where a, a passive vent allows air to pass through. We weren't allowed to change the vent, but we were allowed to, as long as we kept the free area ratio the same, we could create a stage where the mayor actually ended up doing his, hey, welcome everybody to Pennsylvania County of Fine Art. Um, that guy right there is enjoying the day, right? That's what it's all about. He came out to this plaza, it's this cool spring day, and he's, in su he's sunning himself. I love that, that's what it's all about. So this was the second sketch, became reality, and it worked, which was a lot of fun. Um, second, so proud of you guys at Eskenazi. Um, thank you for allowing me and others to participate in this project. This was the headlines for the Business Journal about empathy-driven design, something that we talk a lot about at Land Collective. Um, the idea was to put five principles together about identity and place, to about water and the healing aspects of water and character, about the nutritional uh, uh, benefits uh, that actually Eskenazi was pushing well before others, uh, and the idea that words were powerful and that you can actually inform the populace through great words, and also art, of course, and the idea, I love this one on the pe this piece on the right, remember you're to take your daily dose of color, um, that you could use art in the complement of TC Steel and actually inform health by putting people in the context of great art and great design. Medicine is 10% is perhaps of wellness, there's a 90% is other things, and part of that is art. It's an incredibly powerful tool in changing the dynamic of how people experience the fear of entering into a hospital, right? 
the other great thing was that Eskenazi was willing to give back an extraordinary public space that was philanthropically created, right? That they were willing to dedicate space in a hospital and ask philanthropy to support the design. So this ended up being the, the character of the space in plan, um, and this is what it is in reality. Thank you to the Griffiths for the healing waters. It's an extraordinary fountain that borders one of the edges. Um, thank you to Douglas Mitchell for informing it with great poetry and allowing me to put some of the words in the water so that they disappeared periodically. Um, but again, this is what it's all about, right? The idea that these kids at a play school actually came and frolicked in the water. Check out this little kid right here. It's like Cousin It in a towel, right? <laughs> it's just <laughs> incredible. Um, or this, you know, the notion, this is, what, this is what's incredible, the idea that, that everybody is coming here not necessarily for healing in the actual sense of the word. They're there because they find themselves healed as a human being, whether they need wishes or Eskenazi services or not. And so uh, the idea that it's a sculptural entity that you can actually find a place that is, has a microclimate that you want to be in, um, that uh, the falls, which will go 365 days of the year and become a, a, a frozen fountain of water, it, it's just, just kind of wonderful. Or, or this, that physical therapy can actually take place in a public arena. It's lovely, the idea that we can all be healed in the context of an environment, and that it works at night, too. I mean, it's, it's incredible that it actually became a reality. Um, these people worked really hard, so thank you for awarding them a great thing. Or that art could become a branding device. Um, Richard Lay's piece here um, is uh, covering a garage. It's great. You know, that the idea that people might move around it and it then would change it, their perception of it is kind of wonderful. So it's no doubt in my mind that great art, great design actually informs beyond the specific place. They made the Wall Street Journal for art in a healing environment. That's an international recognition for what art can do for people. It's an incredible thing. Finally, and I'm right on time, you know, um, I love the, this, this year's um, particular invitation uh, that you did. And uh, whoever the artist is, thank you, because actually it r reminds me of my current project uh, at the city of Westfield, um, which was really about uh, nodes and connectors. That happened to be the symbol that we used for that particular project. It's the idea that um, uh, at the end of these electric nodes, uh, people can be charged positively, um, so that these sparks actually represent how all different sorts of people actually might come together in the public realm. And um, the notion was to bring together an extraordinary team of people to actually think collaboratively about what could be, how government in a public park could describe the environment that would want make people want to connect with each other, um, to become their new city downtown park that would define the development that would come for years uh, in the future, and that's kind of fun. So here is the regional map. Um, there's the uh, Grand Park in the upper left, an extraordinary economic engine for the city, um, that this notion that a park based on athleticism could actually drive an economy, extraordinarily br brilliant thinking. Um, that you could actually then use the park, which is situated right there, um, to knit together all the trails into one particular grand junction. So that the idea was this confluence of trails actually became their new central park, where the form of architecture would actually then speak to each other. And so this is, you're getting a preview. Schematic design is about done, but we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, the idea is that this 12-acre park has four pavilions and a river running through it. Um, that it will actually be refurbished ecologically so that it is sustainable uh, and uh, deals with flood water. That light, the, the light in the evening, the, the illumination of the park would speak just as wonderfully um, as the, uh, uh, the, the, the volumes themselves. And that they, the light itself in the evening as these four pieces of architecture, these four pavilions which have their own functions, could change seasonally in, in what they do. So again, uh, you know, the notion that uh, government in balance with philanthropic gestures could actually create something extraordinary. Uh, there, are ex there are wonderful opportunities for informing all of us. Um, so this is what we hope will be in the coming years uh, in the nature of the park. 
uh, and we're very excited to see how this then progresses. So then I just wanted to leave you with this image because the mayor mentioned this in his introductory speak. I didn't know he was gonna say that. This is the, the last image. You are poised as a city to have an extraordinary naissance, not even renaissance, naissance, a birth that, that really knits extraordinary opportunities and uh, in particular, the notion that government should be symbolized by uh, a great space. You have a competition going on called the CCB Plaza, which will position itself near Cummins and the new transit bay. I encourage you to be vulnerable, to think strategically as creative thinkers yourselves about what you want people to see that is emblematically you. Be vulnerable to great design, the idea that it actually might be different from the norm because it will make a statement as it did at Azipanathi, as it did at other places, where great design lifts and elevates culture and brands you as the extraordinary city that you are. I thank you very much. I started with an apple, I give it back to you. Believe in gravity. <laughs> I missed my two minutes. <laughs> Friends, that's the end of our program. Thank you so much for being here today. Make each and every day a day that you can start with art. Thanks for being here.